think we're a good hype. I think we're good and I think we're live. Hello. Just trying to figure out where to Hello. where to be. We have that nice wall hanging back there. That's really that's <laughs> nice. It's very pretty. It's very pretty. I'm gonna wait till we, we get a little eyeball up there at the top that lets us know that people are on board. But um, until then, I'm just going to say hi everybody. This is Karen with Aorta Cope, and we are here doing our live QA with Amy Wagner. Hello. <laughs> and we had the pleasure of having Amy on our in our support group. Um, I think it was a week ago. Not, uh, and our no, support, Sunday night. Yep, yep. it was Sunday night. And our support groups uh, take place um, on Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern. We are moving to a different format starting effective in May. We'll be doing it the first and third Sunday. And then the second and fourth Thursday, we will also be having a support group at 12 o'clock. So, um, if anybody is out there, if you can give us a thumbs up or anything so I know that I've done this correctly. And it does say that we're live. So when it says I'm live now, mm -hmm. I guess we are we are on. And um it's we'll just, just give it another six. minute. Just six, so. I, maybe I jumped the gun and went really You've got hot and heavy. Faster than you realize. Fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm just checking <laughs> to see if I have any if anybody out there has commented. Okay. I'm asking. Okay, um, so what I'm hoping to do tonight is have Amy address a couple different things from what we did in the support group. So in the support group, we talked a lot about PTSD, which we will touch upon towards the end of this, but we talked about um, PTSD and different types of therapy to address that. And I think whether or not you had an emergent situation, just physical trauma of any type, even right. if it's planned surgery, um, could create a degree of, of um, stress and anxiety. We, we will get to that later. So some of the things that we've been hearing on our pages, um, and I've just been reading out there mm -hmm. on the survivor pages and Facebook in general, is a lot about guilt. It seems that that seems to be a topic recently, people feeling um, guilty for having survived, people feeling guilty that they've created possibly a hardship on their loved one, um, that they've had changes for their family, guilty that their kids may be affected. Um, there's a lot of just guilt, and that's pretty heavy, and I think it can happen at any point. But I think I'd like Amy to just kind of, hi, Christina King. Okay, we're, okay. we're getting people now. That's great. So I think I'd like to just have a start with the concept of what happens to us emotionally, um, when we experience something physical, whether it was a planned surgery or it was an unplanned surgery, so let's talk about it from the patient's perspective, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe we can flip it for the caregiver's perspective, okay. what they might go through, and then we'll lead into guilt. So I'm going to let you take the, take the floor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you again for having me back. It's so wonderful. And I do want to say, you know, I welcome anyone's questions. I don't want this to take pl um, be in place of therapy, but let's have a good discussion about what happens. I think for the most part, for those where this came all of a sudden and you had an emergency had to happen with surgery and that sort of thing, the first emotion is just the shock over what's happening. Mm -hmm. And things are happening so fast and rapidly that it's hard to catch a breath on what's going on. They're explaining procedures and sign this and all that. So really the whole processing of everything kind of gets put on delay because there's no time mm -hmm. it, because most of this i understand is a life and death situation so there's just no time to process it that happens the day after count the day after the surgery then you might be laying there and then starting to think okay what all just took place that's when the emotions start coming in. Oh no, what is that going to mean for my life? How is this going to debilitate me or not debilitate me? How is this going to affect me getting back to work or my relationships with my husband, my wife, my kids, all of that. So I think it's a full range of that emotion plus mix in scared to death, fear, the thought of dying that was back there now i i made it through mm -hmm. but um just a rush of all of these different things you know um questioning how did this happen how did i miss signs you know all of those things that kind of run through our brain 
just trying to figure out all of this because the day before you woke up and things seemed all right mm -hmm. today everything's changed so it's just kind of catching your breath and being able to figure it out from there but i think it's the days and the months that follow that's the, when the hardship that's really when is. the hardship the, yeah. the the depression can come in the sadness um the anxiety for sure and that's when you might start noticing more of those PTSD type symptoms. So for instance, if somebody, um, I've heard people, more than one person, I was that person, scared to go to bed, mm -hmm. especially with this, scared that if you walk across the street that you might implode, scared um, if you overwork yourself, right, scared if you fear. listen. I mm -hmm. mean, just fear, 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 all these different things, just pure unadulterated fear. And so how do we work through fear Let's get through that maybe before then we'll, we'll go back and deal with guilt. But how do you get through the fear part? And it, it's kind of a couple part process mm -hmm. because I think you first have to just um, in your own mind remind you, okay, the doctors have said that I'm okay to do X, Y, and Z. I'm alive right now. I'm going to embrace this moment. And I think as each day goes along or months or whatever, you gain a little more confidence in venturing out to do more things. Because I think the tendency is to kind of stay in and kind of just in your safe spot, either in your house or whatever. So you don't venture out that far. And so it's, it's gaining confidence back over time. I'm going to drive or I'm going to go to the store. Or I'm going to and, and learning to do those things without someone but I think in the beginning one way to cope with that is not going out alone mm -hmm. you know take someone with you so that you always have the the comfort of someone there or something happened or, or that sort of thing and then as time goes on and you build that confidence to venture out by yourself um, but I think it's it's a lesson in patience unfortunately but as that time goes on you will build that back so then, um, and real quick to everybody, I see all of you, Susie, Stephen, mm -hmm. Kim, so many mm -hmm. people are joining in. Um, we are not going to take up most of this time talking like this between us. I'm just right. trying to do a <laughs> rapid fire of some thoughts. So get your questions together because I know a lot of you have questions and thoughts because we've talked about them, especially yes. over the last couple of weeks. There's something in the air. There's a lot of people that are feeling a lot of emotion. So get your thoughts together. And in just a few moments, we will open it up to you to just start hitting us with some questions right. and we will try to address them as best as we can. But one of the things we were just mentioning a minute ago is guilt. And I know so many of you feel it. The survivor guilt, the guilt for the changes in your life, the guilt that your partner you know, needs to take on more responsibility, the guilt that you're not the same person you were before this event happened. So That's how it. do we do with the nasty guilt? I think guilt comes from all kinds of sources too, mm -hmm. and really asking yourself what, where is that coming from? Is that because you are you were so used to being the caregiver for everybody else, and now you can't fulfill that role? Is that's what fueling this, mm -hmm. or is it because? Um, you had a falling out with someone prior to this happening and you didn't have an opportunity to get that worked out and now you feel guilty that you did that because what if something had happened and you wouldn't have been able to resolve that so i think really kind of asking yourself the questions like why do i why am i feeling guilty because guilt usually comes from feeling like you've done something wrong mm -hmm. and your conscience is telling you i did something wrong but it's kind of reframing that in your mind and saying, you know, I didn't ask to get ill this way and I didn't do this on purpose to myself. So I didn't plan any of this. And even though it has changed your life and, and those around you, um, it's not something you did on purpose where your conscience is getting the best of you because you know, but um, I think it's important to have these discussions with your family and loved ones about how you're feeling and allow them that opportunity to also express their feelings about it. Yeah, 
I am taking on more responsibilities, but I do that, you know, mm -hmm. give them that opportunity. I love you. That's why I'm helping you. You, yeah, you didn't plan this, but we're going to get through it together and that sort of thing. Um, so real quick, we are having a couple questions okay. pop in. Um, what are some of the techniques we can use to get past the feelings of why was I lucky or an un or the unlucky one who survived this um, major insult to our bodies and our minds? Okay, so this is kind of a glass half empty, half full type of thing, I guess. It's all in the perspective. Um, yeah, that you were, you see it as unlucky because now I have this condition that has changed my life. But lucky that you are here to say I'm a survivor and of this. Uh, I think some of the techniques just or your own way of thinking is one way how to change that around into a more positive just like i feel like um karen may have been feeling this way too you know why me type of thing mm -hmm. but she has taken that and worked it to create this ar to cope program and so i think it's taking that well it happened to me because I have a role to play to help others or I have a purpose in this and so with that I'm going to help others so it's how you choose to take it and use it now uh, for your benefit and those around you that with a similar thing uh, but again I think it's allowing time to help heal those those thoughts and those emotions too um, there, I mean some of the things that I, I've heard people say why me well why not me I'm a badass and I can take it. Well, you know what? I don't really agree to that. I don't subscribe to that. I really didn't want this. And for me, it was really, why me? Well, because genetically my father has a AAA and I developed yeah. an aneurysm and the, the stars aligned and my aneurysm dissected. And that's why it happened. It's a very, to me, a very, not uh, everything happens for a reason. It right. happened because it was a physical thing that happened. Factual it's thing. A factual that, yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I have heard some people out there say, well, why did I survive, but John Ritter didn't? And he might have had more to give to society. And I think that's where someone's being really hard on themselves yeah, losing sight say. of what you have to give to others as well. Yeah, and um, we also don't know all the other details of someone like John Ritter's situation that, you know, there might have been some other factors in there that also were contributing that we just don't know. And so, made his chance of survival a lot less than your own. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes starting when you start in that whole comparison thing, that's when it really starts taking you down. And um, you're here for a reason. And um, it, with all the experiences that any of us use, I think that when we get to a better space, we can turn them around to help others and too. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, how are we able to or maybe again, a technique, I guess, to decrease the amount of anxiety that we experience. Um, so the activities we did when we got sick mm -hmm. and dissected or had a stroke or had a heart attack or anything along those lines, um, how do you decrease the anxiety you feel? So we talked about this. I, I really haven't watched an episode of Ellen DeGeneres since I dissected. I have not watched, I have not been able to watch a full episode. Really? I just, and I loved her show, but that's what, when it happened to me. So how do you- Oh, that, that was on? That was on. I'm going to right oh, on the sofa at 4.30 okay, a.m. Okay. So how do you minimize the anxiety you feel when you're doing something that you were doing that I, when you dissected okay, or I stroke or saying. anything? Because I see that really? as like Ellen DeGeneres show as a trigger for you. Well, yeah, that's so, what they mean, triggers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. identifying those triggers, uh, some, of t some of the time being able to, even if you have others there with you, so for example, if you wanted to get back to watching Ellen, have some support with you mm -hmm. while you do that, so you can create a new memory back with that. Goes in with that whole right. EMDR. So trying to memory. create a new association okay. back again, that can be a more positive thing. So um, if you took walks every day and this happened while you were on a walk, getting back to a different association with that. Go to a park with some friends and do a walk again so that you can see it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. That it just happened to be 
that was what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think. Sometimes they call it like uh, exposure treatment, where you expose yourself again to that triggering event to try to rework that into a positive association. Others, it's just, you know, going back and trying to recapture something that you feel like you might have lost mm -hmm. as a result of your health issue. So uh, something that you once enjoyed. So, Robert, when you ask your three-year survivor, so am I. Um, and I, I see you say life's been uh, super difficult, but you're thankful daily. And you're asking, is it safe to be physically active? So that's a question that's difficult for us to answer as we're not your physician, cardiologist, or surgeon. But <laughs> I know that you're concerned that um, even though you have your doctor's approval, it could damage you in some way. And having that approval, that leads back to, I think, what Amy's saying, yeah. that um, Triggers. It, it might just be for you an emotional trigger. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think, you know, whatever your doctor has uh, cleared you to do, uh, is fine, but I think it's your fear just holding you back a little bit that you have to find a way to push through and see that once you do it, like go back, take a walk, um, whatever it was, um, start on an exercise program or what have you. I think just it, the first step is the hardest. Once you get going again and you see that, okay, I did all right, and it and it felt good and all that. That will give you the encouragement to keep trying that. Uh, but definitely, whatever your doctor is recommending, too. Okay, Debbie says she's not finding anyone that can really help her with her PTSD. PTSD. Mm. So it sounds like you're finding people that really want to give you a lot of medications, which to me, I could be wrong. Oh, sounds yeah. like a psychiatrist. Yeah. And maybe she should be searching for whom? What kind of? therapist definitely i would say well i'm i'm a, a clinical social worker but definitely somebody whether a psychologist or um, a licensed uh therapist social worker but definitely somebody that has specialized or has some expertise in post-traumatic stress disorder and um you know i'm so sad to hear that you're hitting a brick wall there because medication medication will help your symptoms like if you're feeling anxious things like that but the treatment the counseling part is really going to help you process w what all has happened and medications if too much medication i think is just going to numb that it's not going to resolve it or process it it's just going to kind of make it just stay stuck there so I would recommend, like, if you call a counseling agency, ask that question. Is there anyone here that specializes in trauma? Um, especially, I mean, I do a technique called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So I do get people that call and actually ask if anyone there does that mm -hmm. technique. Uh, so something of that sort, for sure. You might also want to contact, if you have insurance, contact yeah. your insurance mm -hmm. agency to ask them uh, for names of psychologists or social workers, right. clinical social workers versus the psychiatrists, mm -hmm. which are usually the ones that Just dispense the medications. And when we become providers with insurance companies, we mostly all of us have filled out profiles of things that we specialize in. So they should be able to tell you and help you find someone that uh, does. Kim. Any thoughts on hypnotherapy? Oh. I'd like to know a little more about that, actually. <laughs> I actually... Um, but let's not do it tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> I actually... Um, hip hypnosis has been a thing that I've been interested in for several years. And um, it was just about a year or so ago that I actually went and was trained to do hypnosis. And I felt found it absolutely fascinating. And... Also, as another adjunct type of treatment for trauma, it's um, just another relaxed state um, to help someone process through a traumatic memory or just to recall some information. Because sometimes when trauma happens, there's so much going on that it just you just kind of miss all the pieces to put it together. The um, 
one situation though with hypnosis is the barrier with the court system so mm -hmm. if if there's anything involved with that uh they won't allow hypnosis but they'll allow emdr but the um the clients that i've worked with so far with hypnosis it's been very interesting and and i even thought you know I didn't even know if I could be hypnotized until I took this training and it, it was really interesting. So do you so. think, cause I know you've done EMDR yourself mm -hmm. and now you've been yes. hypnotized yourself. I, which, <laughs> which one do you think it would be more effective in dealing with physical trauma or trauma from physical ailment? I think um, they both can be effective. Uh, I find that EMDR can move things along just a little bit faster mm -hmm. because you're, you're uh, working with your brain's natural processing through rapid eye movement. Uh, but I think you can f find an effective resolution to things with either one. Uh, there, there aren't as many around that I know. I mean, less people advertise hypnosis. It's usually just something that a therapist has learned and not they don't necessarily advertise that so if you called up and said is there anyone there that does hypnosis they may not always know that a true hypnotherapist does advertise mm -hmm. that but there's a lot of people that know preliminary stuff about hypnosis and they just kind of integrate that into the therapy session melinda you feel so nervous when you exercise, your heart races and you become anxious. So heart racing is very normal. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know. Your cardiologist says everything is normal, but you can't seem to get back into the routine and you feel like you're going to damage things. And you say it's hard to articulate. You articulated that beautifully. <laughs> it's the way everybody feels. Everybody oh, feels yeah. the same way. Um, and I, I don't know if you've been to cardiac rehab, but if that's something that's been prescribed mm -hmm. to you or if you can do it and it's covered with your insurance, it's such a great way to get back into exercise because right. they monitor you the whole time and they teach you about how the heart rate might go up with the blood pressure in the middle of exercising That's and right. then it naturally drops lower than it was before you started afterwards, which is what you want your heart to do. And um, I think that goes back again to just triggers of, oh my that gosh, fear. It's, it's all fear-based. Well, and especially because during exercise, we, we naturally feel our heart beating mm -hmm. and everything. And, and so when you hear your heart beat go up up and your your pulse rate going up that is a trigger to think oh no i'm you something know something wrong. could happen or whatever yeah. but that's what naturally is supposed to happen when we exercise is our heart rate supposed to go up mm -hmm. but there again um your cardiologist is saying that everything is normal and you can get started i think a cardiac rehab program even um maybe like a physical therapist could work mm -hmm. with you on some of those things as well and um but there again it's it's the fear that initial fear but i think the first time you work through that and you can get started back on just a very low-key routine i i think you'll build that confidence back and that is a good idea because you can more than likely get your cardiologist to write you a script mm -hmm. for, for physical therapy and they will take your blood pressure before yeah, during and after that just like in cardiac rehab, and it's a good way to build your stamina and confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so another comment was made by Diane, and it's been nine years. I think it's, you're going on 10 years almost. If oh, you're wow, wonderful. And she's been having like that 10-year itch. She's been getting flashbacks and um, okay. doesn't know how to handle when those, well, that's again trigger-based, I'm sure. Something happens, and next thing you know, you're seeing and remembering things. So how do you is handle the Is the 10-year, is that a marker? Uh, or is it or let is me it tell you, like one year uh, two years three years year, okay. every year's a marker it's amazing <laughs> but actually i think once you get past those first three to five then it's it's a little bit more smooth sailing they say but um those first few are a little bit more precarious but how do you handle flashbacks because i've been getting them too flashbacks uh can either just completely catch you off guard when they when they come up oh Thanks. sorry one second knock at the door somebody's asking a question in the office I'm just gonna entertain you for just a split second we're just looking for somebody's keys that was in here for um, yeah things happen that's live okay in three two one flashbacks back okay uh, 
So the, most of the time, that's why flashbacks catch you off guard. And I think first, knowing what a flashback is. So if it happens to you, you're not so surprised. You can say, oh, okay, that's a flashback. So the definition of a flashback is just something that has triggered you to have your brain respond by bringing a memory to the conscious level. And sometimes it may be something that you had totally forgotten and it just has been brought back up, or it may be something that you didn't even remember to begin with. Uh, it's important to just take some time, deep breathe, slow yourself down, acknowledge what happened. And I always recommend journaling that, write it down because the the emotion that comes up with it could make you forget parts so i recommend you know just grab a piece of paper or something and jot that down journal that and then definitely take that to your therapist or talk it out with a very close confidant i i think it's important that when you've gone through something like this to have a a confidant or a point person that you can go to to kind of just vent it or discuss it they don't need to necessarily say a whole lot but just have that person uh set up that you can talk with okay next question um uh, okay this might be posed to other survivors as well so those of you that are with us right now um who have had a traumatic dissection do you tend to take your ptsd seriously um or are you ignoring it and brushing it off. Uh, somebody says that they were a staunch PTSD denier for years and have finally received EMDR treatment with good results and strongly recommend pursuing treatment for folks who might also think they're impervious to the psychological effects of trauma. I'm another person and I don't know who that is. I don't know if Meg is on tonight. I know that she's on a trail hiking, but she did EMDR as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and obviously this is how I met Amy because I specifically was told about her from another therapist that was doing just cognitive therapy with me. I was told about EMDR and mm -hmm. it is weird and it is strange <laughs> and it is uncomfortable, but I will tell you six, about six weeks, things really, really, when I stopped lying about why I couldn't come into my therapy session and I sucked it up and, and came in, <laughs> um, it, it really, it made a very big difference. But uh, it, that is a good question. I wonder how many of you out there suffer with it and just ignore it or deny it. I mean, it. I think that uh, maybe, they just don't realize what it is. Mm -hmm. That a lot of times uh, post-traumatic stress is associated with like combat and soldiers, whatnot. And so I don't think a lot of people may even recognize that, hey, I, I could have PTSD. So I think a lot of it is um, educating yourself on that. And I, I'm hoping that now that hospitals are more aware of this condition and all that they would at least hand out something you think i mean in our wildest dreams yeah, yeah. they would not just focus on the medical but uh and some of the things and, related to ptsd because i didn't even know this could be nightmares certain yes. types of nightmares i, I was having sleep disturbance all yeah, over the all place is a, a big one but i think uh if you're associated with a hospital like mm -hmm. you were that has a team. Yeah. If a if a social worker or a therapist was on that team, they would be able to provide the patient with information on this is what is normal emotional responses to a situation like this and give you that that educational material. So you won't be called off guard. You can say, oh, yeah, they told me about this, and this is a flashback. This is what I do. And I always, you know, try to include that in my, when I first meet with a client, mm -hmm. to kind of educate them on the terms so that if, because once you do EMDR, it's not uncommon for other things to come up too that you had totally forgot about, things that you thought you had dealt with and so you never know what next layer of that onion could peel off and catch you by surprise yeah so i think it's it's good to try to educate yourself even if the hospital isn't really being mm -hmm. proactive on that part 
And then there's the whole, uh, I see Christina saying she recognizes it, but she's been trying to handle it on her own mm -hmm. and it's not working out too well. Um, whereas Dr. Phil would say, how's that been working for you so far? Um, so one of the things I also read is um, that has to do with triggers would be ambulance, oh, an ambulance yeah. siren, which that's a big one for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, or at least it was, it's definitely so much better, but helicopters, that's a big one for me still. Um, and when I go just generally into a hospital setting, even a colonoscopy room, if they have lights overhead, it's weird if there's lights overhead, I hear heart machine beepers beeping, even though they're not oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I smell always alcohol. So different things trigger different things. But I know one of the things I took away from meeting with you was just be honest and tell people around me, yeah. I have PTSD and please don't move so fast because I might right. end up under the bed. Um, be, know, your, be your own advocate. You just really need to. Yeah, just you've got them. to be your own advocate and mm -hmm. say, you know, because they're so, let's go, let's go, let's get this done. But I think that, you have to let them know ahead of time. You know, I have difficulty. Uh, I have PTSD, you know, and I have difficulty just smelling an alcohol swab or just looking at a needle or just <laughs> being here in this room, just the smell of everything in here or the sounds and, and let them know that because mm -hmm. there's a definite line between mental medical and the mental health and the two disciplines don't always think on those terms. I think because I've worked with medical so much mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm trying to be more aware and cognizant of it, but uh, not always the case in, in the doctor's office. So, and keeping in mind that the triggers come from all five of your senses. So it can be the touch of something, the smell, the, the hearing of something, uh, the sight of something. And uh, what I leave out, the, um, Sound. Sound, yeah, sound of something. So, so we can't yeah. do any EMDR right now or no. hypnotherapy. <laughs> but one of the things yeah. we have talked about is maybe you can show or explain. And I don't know, have you ever done? T you do tapping? I do tapping. So maybe we can just explain that as a tool for grounding, and then explain how people can ground using mm -hmm. the other senses. Because that's been, I've been doing that for years without knowing I was doing it. I would just do touch and just rub right here right. to decompress something. But now I try to purposely smell mint. I try to look for it. And next right. thing you know, I forgot that I'm stressed out. So if you can explain and, grounding. And and I look at grounding as something that you use all five senses to do. And I, I incorporate that with a technique called finding your safe place. And it's just something that you can envision in your mind that thinking about that just puts you at a very calm state a very peaceful, safe feeling state. So, uh, and in that, you know, if, say you pick the beach or something, focus on the smell of the French fries that might be coming from the boardwalk, the, the seagulls making the sounds in the sky, the listening to the waves going in and out, feeling the sand on your feet, you know, all of those types of things that can kind of just help you relax and be in that moment. And I just, I call that your safe place. And I think when you're feeling anxious or having a flashback or something of that sort, go to your safe place. Now, one of the things with EMDR, because I don't want you processing stuff on your own without the professional there, but one of the things I call the butterfly, I just cross my arms like this and I just lightly tap on each of my shoulders. And that is getting your brain to go from one side to the other called bilateral brain stimulation. And that works with your regular rapid eye movement. So if you think of your safe place and you just do the little taps, believe it or not, just that. You can tap each knee, uh, whatever works for you there. But uh, I like the, the butterfly because I feel like I'm giving myself a hug too when I'm doing that. And mm -hmm. it's even more comforting. But uh, that's just a quick little technique that I show my clients just when they're outside of therapy, they can do for themselves. Um, another technique, and I, I was doing this with my son when he was having some, a lot of anxiety when mm -hmm. he was younger, uh, before we would go to bed, the tensing and relaxing. Yeah. Can you explain that? And that you can, anxiety, you can do uh, like it, a progressive relaxation. You can start with your toes and work to your head. And you can just start by like tightening your toes up, 
hold it for five seconds, release. Then tightening your feet up, uh, hold, release until you progressively go all the way to the top of your head. What I like to also have you envision is while you're doing that, maybe that safe place or a light stream, a warm light stream, just following up your body as you're doing that, kind of like comforting that and feeling the warmth of that as well. Um, it just is another way to kind of release tension that is built up over the day, especially if you're having some problems going to sleep at night and everything to get yourself more in that relaxed state. Because I think for a lot of people that are able to go to work or deal with their children all day when mm -hmm. that nighttime hour comes and yes. if you are if you don't have a significant other or you do or it doesn't really matter when the nighttime comes and there's nothing for you to do to keep you busy and then right. all you're left with is your thoughts oh yes it's the worst time of day it is and that would be a good time to do those techniques that is because bedtime can be the worst because mm -hmm. uh you're laying there with your mind idle and just mulling over something all over again and that makes it difficult. You lay there, but sometimes if you're laying there for too long, I'd say if, if you lay there more than 15 minutes doing that, then I would suggest you get up and do something and then try to go back to bed. But I would try those techniques first, the progressive relaxation, focusing on a word. Uh, I've even had some clients that have learned to sing a particular song to themselves, kind of like, um, a mommy does to their baby or something. I have some weird just, song then stuck in my head all night. to kind of yeah. relax you, yeah. uh, but it's something that has a very positive mm -hmm. association with it. Yeah. Uh, anything that you can find, you know, one thing may not work for everybody, so you have to kind of find your thing that works for you. And Diane mentioned something here, which I know has happened for me. Um, how, how do you handle it when all of a sudden you're having that PTSD moment for whatever reason in front of a group of people who already think you're fine, you're healed, everything's good, and then you flip out. I, I was at a Billy Joel concert, which was outdoor stadium, and a helicopter flew overhead oh, to wow. Maryland shock mm -hmm. trauma. Mm -hmm. And in my favorite song was on too. He was playing my favorite song, <laughs> but I don't remember any of that. All I remember is, I, I swear I was in, a, I could picture the room of this shock trauma, like the highest level emergency place you would go here in Maryland. And I could, I was hearing things, smelling things, everything. And, um, you know, my, I just shrunk into a ball and my husband asked me if I was okay. And I just put my hand up. I just needed mm -hmm. to just, I just like tapping my feet. I'm like rubbing my head. I'm trying to feel the cold air. Um, my one brain is part of my brain is like, it's your favorite song. You're missing it. But Sometimes it's hard. It's hard to yeah, calm it, it down. And what do you do when you're in front of people? And it's not always something that you can just snap out of that fast. Because I think sometimes if you're with someone and they don't understand what's going on, they want to try to quickly get you to you know, snap out of it and it's okay and all that. But I think it's important that you just come up with a phrase to alert that person. Like, I just need a moment or give me a minute, those mm -hmm. kinds of things so that they know that's your communication with them just to give you, you know, this period of time, you're going to work it through. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, just like when we have an anxiety attack, a lot of times people may not notice that it's going on mm -hmm. unless there's other really more outward things. So sometimes you might think that people are really wondering what's, but you're hiding it better than you yeah. <laughs> realize but um i think if you have a, a phrase or a way to communicate with that person like you know i just give me a time out just here and yeah and um most of the time you can work through a flashback if it is something you've remembered from before mm -hmm. if it's something totally out of the blue that you totally forgotten about or had been repressed or something like that I mean, you may need to take a moment and remove yourself, mm -hmm. go to a safer place, go to the bathroom or go somewhere where away from all of that that's going on. Yeah. Um, you may need to go sit in your car. You just sometimes don't know when it might happen. But I think 
you just go to the safest place that you feel safe. Like if you're in a, in a grocery store or something like that, go back out to your car. I would go to the pastries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me go um, eat some sugar. <laughs> um, I do. There's two things I really want to talk about. Um, I've been seeing on here that, um, hi, Jamie, that Kim has a lot of questions. So, Kim, you take your time. You write your questions. We have at least another 10, 15 minutes we're gonna go. So take your time, write your questions. And if if we can't get to them because you're overwhelmed, take some time tonight mm -hmm. or tomorrow, write them, and I will have Amy answer yeah. them oh, for definitely. you. We can do an definitely. email with that. Yeah. Yeah. But there's 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 two things. Um, one, <laughs> no, one, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I remember one. Gosh, I'm not gonna remember the second one. Competition. I think a lot of us feel when we hear other people's stories online, we feel ashamed and um, embarrassed that we ever felt bad about ourselves. And I know that this, oh, I remember the second one, just say okay. what if. Okay, um, what if. <laughs> um, and, I, and I do this sometimes myself. Uh, the first time I went to an in-person support group meeting for Crohn's and colitis, um, I walked in there, I just had two back-to-back -back surgeries, and I listened to all these people talk about, ironically, having ostomy bags, which everybody now knows I have one, um, listening to all these stories, and I was hysterically crying. And I told them my story of needing back-to-back -back surgery because of an abscess, and they started crying. And I'm like, why are you crying? And they said, how, how are you even functioning having two surgeries? Oh, my gosh, we feel so bad. And I said, you have bags. I, how are you functioning? <laughs> was, oh you, you hear somebody else's story. Yeah. And, and I think it's so irrational to feel bad for yourself because it was really bad for me then. And not taking away anybody mm -hmm. else's bad, but bad for me is not the same bad for you. So That's right, exactly. How do you, so many people out here are experiencing this. And how do you Because that is very subjective. It? Yeah. And there again, we can't get into that mode of comparing ourselves to others. And... And because I think, like you're saying, you were minimizing mm -hmm. what you went through Myself. because, yeah, and and really um, with that minimizing may even have started this guilt thing. Like, what yeah. am I sitting here complaining about? Look yeah, at them, they, you know. And so I think it's it's keeping it in a perspective of, yeah, your bad isn't the same as theirs, but it's subjective to mm -hmm. your situation and we've all experienced something here and mm -hmm. it we all deal with it differently we all take a different level of intensity with what has happened but being very careful of the comparison thing i think that's when you get in trouble with your emotions when you start doing that um the other thing i wanted to address i'm trying to hit as many different things that mm -hmm. i've been reading from all of you online yeah the what ifs, the dreaded what ifs, the worst, oh my God, and we all do them and it doesn't, and one of the things that I discovered talking with Diane on a conversation is that um, this, this disease, even if we've had surgery, even if it's been 10 years, even if it's been 20 years, it's very linear and there's gonna be a point where maybe it's not a good day. And that just means yeah. just that day is a bad day, but um, it doesn't mean that you're never ever gonna be triggered when you're five, 10 years, 20 years out. That's true. You can have a That's bad day true. because something else went awry. That's right. So um, I think the worst I heard was the what ifs. What if, and we've talked about this, mm -hmm. the shoe, the next shoe is gonna drop for me because it's been you know, 25 years of my life that I've had chronic situations occur. Mm -hmm. And okay, so now if everything's fixed, well, now what's going to happen? I'm so you're always anticipating what, what the next it? thing. The what next if, thing? What if this happens? What if I get my scan in two weeks, and something's wrong? What if my echo shows my aortic valve is worse? Then what if? But yeah, but that sucks. I know. What <laughs> that's not. What are you going to do? That means I don't have control, and I don't have control right. over that's it. And that's what, what it is. leads back that's down to. That's what it is. Exactly. Is we? I think an experience like this really ups the need for control yeah. because when it happened nothing went in control right. <laughs> everything right. was out of control that you felt yeah but the medical end of it felt like okay we're going to take care of this we're going to mm -hmm. do this this and this and take get it back mm -hmm. into control but you felt that loss of so i think with any trauma we all try that's a, a normal thing is to try to look at ways that we can control as much as possible mm -hmm. and a lot of it depends too on what you were like prior to this is going to enter into that too so if you were someone that 
tended to be a little more anxious or controlling prior to, that's just going to be ramped up <laughs> even more. Um, so um, it's, it's realizing that some of the things that you're experience, experiencing were what you lived prior to. Mm -hmm. It's just the magnified version of that right yeah. now. And it's just learning ways to bring that back down into perspective for yourselves. Um, and, and last but not least, until we get a few more questions, um, I know um, the majority of us on here tend to be patients or survivors, but there are caregivers out mm -hmm. there. And if they're not all watching tonight, go home and tell your loved ones they can come back and watch this and maybe yeah. gain another perspective of how you feel. But let's talk about a little bit of how we can help caregivers because I'm sure they, at some point, as much as they love us, must experience the compassion fatigue, yes, yes. must feel resentful. I mean, I've had these conversations with my husband who's wonderful, but I'm like, I know you've got to be resentful. This isn't what you signed up for. And But we're married. I love you. But it isn't what you signed up for. And I know I scared you. And he's He's always scared. Yes. He's, you know, he's angry. He goes through the same process of well, grief. Well, he had a secondary yeah. traumatization. You right. know, yeah. the person in your life that experienced it with you also was traumatized. And maybe they don't realize that or it hasn't really been explained to them like that. And I always offer, you know, if any family members want to come in and talk about that, we can and talk about it with the client and really explain what secondary trauma is. But um, I think the whole compassion fatigue is, it may be that, you know, they're getting tired of all that, but I think it's just their need to, to try to get things back in as much of a normal, if you can say that, you know, that it was prior to all of that. And I think that's just their need to try to, settle it in their minds that things are okay and it's it's going to be all right and things are better now and those sort of things but i think that just like it's it's great to have this aortic hope support group there needs to be some type of support network for the caregivers too and i i know some hospitals and places offer caregiver support groups um sometimes it might be associated with caring for any type of um, family member, but I think the the issues are very similar. And so I encourage them to also seek some help and support in that way as well. I mean, Jamie just wrote, she's mm -hmm. a caregiver and PTSD is real for caregivers too. And I'm sure mm -hmm. it is. And yes. I'm sure there's a degree that's of it. longing to have control as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why many caregivers may be yeah. like, but you're fine. You're fine. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Well, and I think people that don't understand the depth of trauma and PTSD, mm -hmm. they, they think by a certain period of time, you should be over it. Mm -hmm. Just like when someone has experienced the loss of a loved one and they're getting into year two or year three and they're still grieving that person. That's, that's subjective as well, but there's a lot of people who say, wow, that's been like three years. You're not, you're not over that yet, or you haven't worked. Well, it's, it's different for everybody. And so I think sometimes a caregiver tends to get to a point where they can start minimizing it. Like, oh, it's been five years. Mm -hmm. You should be, I think, better than you realize. Or why are you still thinking that way? And that pours more guilt on and right. things like that and so I it's just do, this I do, cycle and I do think going that some of it is it's not even so much that they don't understand because i'm sure a lot don't but i think a lot of it is too they just want us to move past because yes. they're scared also and I, yeah. I saw my sister was on earlier commenting on my jazz hands in our brief intermission <laughs> um and one of the things we had said to each other is we had often talked about the idea of when if my parents pass away we don't believe that it ever will happen but when they pass away how we're going to handle and get through that we never talked about what life was going to look like if one of us passed away like it wasn't even okay. on the table okay. until this happened and i can't even imagine what i what i okay i almost said what i did to her but i didn't do anything to her i can't even imagine what this episode might have been like for her um you know to go through I mean, That's it's horrible when I know she's in pain because she has a chronic condition. It, it kills me, but I can't imagine what it must have been like to know that I might not have, have survived surgery, even as, though I did. As a sibling, you're as saying. a sibling, yeah. yeah. It's not something you talk about. Well, and I think about, too, um, you had a brief, but had 
a short opportunity to talk with each of your family members mm -hmm. and say goodbye. I think about the the conversation you had with your son. Yeah. Um, have you gone back and revisited that with no. him? And, you know, I think that's the important thing is to open up that dialogue uh, with that person as difficult and uncomfortable as that may feel. I think that just like with anything, we have to talk about death. That's as much a part of a life that we have to address it. And I think the more we can do ahead of time and when it does happen, it kind of lessens all that has to be done. Um, but I think it's taking that courage and having that conversation because it's just, just as you all have experienced the one minute you're fine and the next minute you're not. And, and what that means, you all have a, a whole different perspective on life and death mm -hmm. that those of us that haven't experienced that just don't have that knowledge and that, you know, experience but i think you value life more oh yeah and that's that's a, a good thing i mm -hmm. think that you you take it more serious or you don't take it don't waste yeah. time as much or right. that kind of thing and when you maybe that might bring up some anger issues when you see people out here just kind of living frivolously haphazard and they're just not taking their lives mm -hmm. seriously but um, hi, Alexander from Switzerland. Thanks oh, so much. I have no idea what neat. time it is there, but that's kind of <laughs> wow. great. Um, you know, Kim does bring up a point, and Kim, you are not the only person in our community who has experienced this, unfortunately. To oh, make yeah. a long story yeah. short, Kim is um, Kim is one of quite a few out there whose doctors did not believe her, did not listen mm. to her, made her almost think that she was crazy, and, oh, my um, and, and her anxiety was creating false symptoms um, and it turns out that she had an aneurysm I mean I, and I can't remember right off the top of my head if you dissect it so I'm sorry because there's a couple different stories and some did and some didn't and had scheduled surgeries but nevertheless the common theme was mm. the doctors didn't listen to what they had to say and they had to fight 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 for months to get somebody to do the right tests oh my and then it's goodness. like how do you trust the medical community mm. when that happens and the only thing I was able, I thought to tell Kim is what a, what a, if you flip it to what a gift you've been given in being able to be an advocate for yourself and you yeah. know your body. Oh um, yeah, yeah. But how do you how do you rectify the Ooh. physicians and then they don't listen? I mean, how do you get past that emotionally? Because now when you feel every ping and pang, which is normal to to be nervous, how do you um, how do you get past that? Cause you want to go to the doctors, but you don't know if they're going to listen to you. So what yeah. could you do? I think that's why it's so important that you shop around for a doctor too, and really talk with them about your experiences and really find somebody just like a therapist, find someone that you really feel is listening to you, hearing you and is doing everything that you would like to see in a doctor. Like even if you have a, a ping or a, a feeling or whatever that you can call, they're going to be um, available to you to um, talk about that. I think it, it's important to shop around for those specialists mm -hmm. and have that team, your cardiologist, your primary care, all of those people that are involved in that. But it may take uh, almost interviewing, mm -hmm. interviewing that. them to find that right person. And that's you being an advocate for yourself. I think with today's healthcare, you have to be. Uh, you definitely have to and speak up that this is what I've been through, this is how I feel, and this is what I'm looking for. And it almost like you interview them. I'm so. very clear. Mm -hmm. I've told my doctors, I, I can't, oh, yeah. don't send me to, don't tell me to send you an email and then the nurse practitioner calls me back and then has to call you and then <laughs> call me back. I want a doctor that I can reach when I need to, because if, if I can, then I don't ever feel like I need to. So right. when you tell me that I have to go through all the hoops, that then I start having things wrong with me, just because I can't well, reach you. Well, just like if they say your test results should be back on Wednesday. I want to know them all. You, <laughs> right. Don't make me wait until the following right. Monday to hear something. You know, it's yeah. those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I think those um, doctors do exist. Uh, 
and you just have to search for them. Sometimes I find that some surgeons aren't necessarily the warm and fuzzy that you're looking for, but definitely your primary care, your cardiologist, mm -hmm. because cardiologists, they work with life and death. I, you would think that they would be more amenable to it, but not necessarily. Yeah. So I think you really, and you'll know, because just like, Kim, right? Mm -hmm. You had a gut feeling about your body. I think that that shows that you also have a, a real like intuitive sense about people too. So you will know after a few questions of talking with them, if that's somebody that you feel you can trust. Okay. Well, Kim, as far as the meds to calm you, mm -hmm. that's where having the, 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 the tools and talking with a the therapist if you don't want to do all the medication route would yeah. really come because I think you had mentioned you were getting a lot of meds from a psychiatrist and mm -hmm. um, and you really might want to try more of the cognitive type of therapy. Yeah, and there may be some like natural things. Mm -hmm. I've really over the last few years started really, you know, looking into essential oils and different mm -hmm. things. So there may be some more natural things that you could try that would be more helpful as well with and we will do a live event on that soon i was just we did that last year we will have one soon again for everybody that's new but being that it is 655 well time flies flew by. And this was so great <laughs> sure all does. of you guys had such wonderful <gasps> questions if um if you have a last second question i'm giving you a minute or two to post it real quick um and if we don't get to your questions for those of you that are viewing this after this live event please post your questions and um the team at Aortic Hope will diligently try to capture all of those tomorrow and get them to Amy and we will try to get them answered for you. We will probably post those in our private forum. So if you have not asked to join that yet, please do so. I think it's a more appropriate place to post uh, the answers to those specific questions. Okay. Um, and then before we wrap up again, uh, we will be ho hosting um, our Sunday support group, not this Sunday and not next Sunday because of the holidays, but we will pick it back up again. I believe it's April 8th and we won't be doing one on the 15th because we're wrapping up the symposium. Yeah. So it will be the 8th, the 22nd and the 29th. And then starting in May, it will be the first and third Sunday at 12, I'm sorry, at 7 p.m. Eastern and the second and fourth Thursday at noon Eastern. And, and uh, Tia will get all of those time uh, times posted for you and we just want to take a second to, oh, do we have any questions? Nope, nope, we're good. Just wanted to thank, thank Amy you. again so You're much. Welcome. Thank you. It's Anytime. always so great. So <laughs> I will get you questions so to you. But yes. all of you, thank you again so much. And we will talk to you soon and send your questions to us. Okay. Take Bye. Care. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>